Good evening. I am Richard S. McGee, and you are watching The Learning Tree. I have with me a gentleman who has been in the shadows, as I told him, uh, Anthony Parker, who is the principal of Western Weston High School. And we're going to talk about Weston High School. We're going to talk a little bit about Mr. Parker. So let us start out with you. Tell me, do people call you Tony? No. <laughs> okay. Everybody I know who's Anthony has been called Tony. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> do you mind if I call you Tony? <laughs> I prefer Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell me a little bit about uh, how you started out in this world, uh, where you came from, your, your little history on yourself. Well, I was born in New York City. New York City, born and uh, raised. Big, 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 big city thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to a single mom who now lives in Central Square. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved her up here about 20 years ago. Okay. And, what, uh, what brought you here? Uh, Cynthia did. And uh, we, well, tell, tell, tell me who Cynthia is. Cynthia is my wife. You're pointing to her. Nobody can see her but us. <laughs> okay. Cynthia is my wife who's behind okay. the cameras okay. there. She's back and there hiding behind I the camera. I moved there. here in 1991 to get married. Okay. And All never right. left. And, but I started life uh, once I graduated uh, high school. Uh -huh. And we jumped around a lot. So uh -huh. I was born in Brooklyn and then spent time in Harlem uh -huh. uh, with my woman I considered my grandmother. Um, uh, I lived with her full time for several years and then back to Brooklyn with my mom and then Queens. Mm -hmm. And Queens. Okay. And from there, uh, I went to, uh, she put me in a private high school. All right. She gave me a choice, your own bedroom or private school, and then said private school. <laughs> said, okay, where thanks. was that school? Uh, okay. Oakdale Prep doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Oakdale Preparatory was in Bayside, Queens. Okay. And then I went to the Midwest for college. Okay. I went to Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. Okay. And my goal in life was to be a journalist. A what? A journalist. <laughs> okay. And that's so all. So now you kind of skip past that. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead with your story. <laughs> uh, uh, I, all I ever wanted to do uh -huh. and for the first seven years after college that's what I did and I worked for publications in New York and in Washington DC and was a magazine writer and I enjoyed it thoroughly and then I moved to Massachusetts uh, after spending four years in Washington uh, I moved to Massachusetts and I worked for Dollars and Cents magazine. When did you move to Mass? Uh, 1991. Yeah one year after I moved to Wellesley. Is that right? Okay. Right. I moved here in 1980. Okay. All right. And, uh, and so uh, then I went, you know, often on somebody would say, oh, you should be a teacher. You're good with kids. You should be a teacher. And I like, no, no, no. And I ended up going to grad school at the Harvard Ed School. Okay. And fell in love with teaching and never looked back. Uh, never looked back. And maybe I'll get back to journalism one day. Maybe I won't. Uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, I taught at Newton South High so where School. Where did you start? Where did you, where did you begin teaching? Well, I, I student taught at Dorchester High School because the, our first 12 years of marriage and in Massachusetts for me, we were in Dorchester. Mm -hmm. In Dorchester. Uh, and I student taught at Dorchester High School, the old Dorchester High School. Okay. And I only applied to Boston public schools. And I never heard from them. Uh, uh, never heard a thing from them. Uh, they had my resume, I sent, you know, HR, the whole nine yards, nothing. Hmm. And so one day I get a call from a gentleman from Newton South High School hmm. that I had never heard of because mm -hmm. I didn't drive. I got my license for the first time when I took the job in Weston. How did he know about you? I, probably from the ed school. Okay. All right. And uh, so I called the green line and said, how do I get to Newton? Uh, and uh, three days later, I had a job. In where was that? Newton South. Newton, Newton South, South High School. Okay. Taught history. Okay. Taught history. And yeah, I know there. where Newton South is. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, to make a long story short, I was at both high schools. I was a teacher and a house master at Newton North, and I spent 13 years in Newton. Hmm. And then I went to Weston as a principal. I was hired in 2006. How did you, how'd they find you in Weston? Well, uh, a gentleman by the name of Ray Shirtliff who I worked with in Newton, he also worked in Boston and Cambridge. He called me uh, and said, Anthony, you should apply to Weston. And I said, no. And I said, Newton was as suburban as 
that I was going to get. <laughs> and uh, he called me twice, mm -hmm. and he said, you should apply. And he said, here are the, some of the benefits, you know, learn how to be a principal, learn the craft, you know, a smaller school, you know, and then if you want, you can move on someplace else. And so I went through the process, and 12 years later, here I am. Here you are. Here I am. Let's talk about the early days, the early mm -hmm. days at, at Weston. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about how those were. Well, coming you, to you're Weston. You're in the suburb now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Weston was a very, is very similar to Newton South, but very different. And Richard, I remember when I was walking up the walk to Weston High School for my interview, I knew exactly where I was. It was Newton South, 1993 just a smaller version. <laughs> so I knew where I was. Yeah. And um, the early days were, they were good, but they were turbulent, not in an outward way, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's sort of like running for office for the first time and then right. winning, right? right? right. And there's okay. running for office and being elected. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's different, <laughs> you know? Because right. after 13 years in Newton, it was a new culture. Okay? new families, mm -hmm. new relationships, mm -hmm. right, that you had to get to know, right? And right. they knew a resume, they knew snippets from interviews, but they didn't know me and I didn't know them, mm -hmm. you know? And, but having said that, one of the things that I found very hopeful and grateful about was I've had very supportive superintendents. Alan Olaf hired me and would not Same let me feel. Ever since you've been there? No. 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 I've had, well, we've had several. Alan Olaf was there my first two years, his last two years. He hired me, was very supportive. Um, and then Cheryl Maloney was superintendent for the next seven years. Okay. And then we've had a series of interims since then, John Brackett and Bob Tremblay and now Midge Connolly, uh, who's from Newton, mm -hmm. um, is the current superintendent of Weston. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great place for me to grow, to learn the craft of how to lead and how to be a principal, All right? And um, I do appreciate the size because you can f I feel like I can accomplish things working with teams of people mm -hmm. from having a thought to actually having the idea come to fruition as a program or a policy. All right. And uh, that's one of the things that I learned. Uh, did you Weston. feel much pressure when you first started up? I felt a lot of pressure that I put on myself. I come from the era where it's twice as good to be equal, right? And so um, you can't, don't ever let them see you sweat, <laughs> okay. right? Now that's eased up over time because I have relationships and I have a track record, good, bad, or otherwise, you know, mistakes and all, but you know, I'm a known quantity. You know, which is to be expected, and, yeah. that's, and that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there was pressure, and, and I know that some folks um, had questions about it. Um, they some may not folks had big questions about it, I would suspect. Big questions about right. it, how would I do, students and parents, and right. you, know, you know, and I know this through indirect conversation. No one would actually say that I you. You know, out loud, but sure. Um, because you want to be seen as smart, you want to be seen as effective, you want to be seen as you can do the job, you know? And no, folks didn't make a mistake, you know, right? And, no. and, uh, uh, and that I was somebody people could do business with, you know? And that I could be a role model for not only kids of color, black, Asian, or whatever, but white kids as well. How was the population? Uh racially when you first got there? It was overwhelmingly white, hmm? you know, overwhelmingly white, yeah. you know, and that's changed like, over like time. Like all suburban schools were at one time. Right, and you know, in the next... Uh, and you, the got there, you got there at least uh, um, some years after Medco had moved in. Yes, we're, we're yeah. actually next year, this school year, coming school year, Medco and Weston will be 50 years old. 
Metco, I, Metco. In Weston. Well, Met, yeah, Metco's already 50 years old, I thought. Uh, in Weston, the Weston oh, program. Weston. Oh, you guys have been around for a long time. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And You've been around a long time. It's the parent company. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And uh, they when, just celebrated their 50th this year. Yes, I was at that celebration. Right. And so Weston will celebrate this coming school year 50 years. Okay. 50 years. So that's exciting. So you had a, you had a smothering of... of uh, Black faces in your school. Yes, uh, yes, we have. We've always consistently had a you know a cohort of black faces, some larger than others, sometimes smaller than others. Mm -hmm. um, we have a small Latino population, huge Asian, Asian American population of different persuasions: mm -hmm. Chinese, Japanese, Korean, you know, East Asian. Right? What's the Asian population in Western? Do you know? In uh, Wellesley, it's about uh, twenty-seven hundred. I don't know the numbers, but percentages, percentage-wise, it's the second largest group, uh, next to whites. And minor and um, uh, Afro-Americans. Uh, they would come under that. We're about uh, six, seven percent. You know. Has your minority population grown over the years? E it's grown, but not necessarily. You know, African American. Hmm. All right, and okay. and so our rising our. our the momentum in terms of population right now, I would say, is Asian, Asian Americans. You know. Tell me about some of the early challenges that you had when you got there. Well, I think the early challenges, you know, um, you know, showing people that I could do the job. You know, you know can you make decisions? Can you make hard decisions? Mm -hmm. Right, and. Um, um, just, I, you know, identifying myself as a leader, so that people, you know, know how, what to make of me. Of course. You know, uh, and I think that was the biggest challenge. You know, I, I, you know, in those early years, I can't think of a situation where my race necessarily was put in stark relief. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but it was in decisions that I made. You know, um, the policies that I wanted to implement. You know, and how I, how I managed, how I managed people, you know. Uh, and so it was in, you know, this challenges was in, am I doing the job and am I sending the right message out to people, mm -hmm. right? That they can trust me, that they can work with me, all right? All right, um, that, you know, we're still, this is still going to be an excellent school mm -hmm. and you're not going to lose any ground. And that first year... We were number one in the uh, Newsweek magazine, which could only help, you know. <laughs> That's uh, good. Uh, yeah. And so, a uh, Boston magazine, rather. All right. And, um, okay. uh, and so, uh, and the mistakes I made, I think, were mistakes in, you know, um, uh, did I use my leaders effectively enough? Um, did I reach out to the right people often enough? Did I collaborate, you know, enough? Um, you know, black folks in the community were thrilled, you know, um, uh, at that time, uh, you know, because I was the first. I was the first, you know, and so no matter what you did, do I think eyes were on me? Um, sure, sure, they absolutely. I guess did. Western must be one of the few suburban schools that has a, a minority principal. Well, Wayland had one for a while. Wayland had one for a while. Uh, okay. Patrick Tutwiler, he was principal there for a few years. All right. uh, now he's moved on. Um, doing other, I think he's an assistant superintendent somewhere. Uh, but so our our rival, Wayland High School, if you will, <laughs> that's the town rivalry. But for a while they had a black male principal. Is that right? Yeah, Patrick Tutwiler. He was there four or five years. Okay. Yeah. At what point along your career did you begin to feel really comfortable? I would say in my fifth, sixth year. Um, why was that? Number one, um, a lot of the people in the leadership I began to hire. Okay. They were my hires. Um, and Families knew me, a cohort of families that knew me, and, and they had other children who were coming in, so I was a known quantity. And um, 
we were able to do some things, beginning to really get traction on some things in the high school, you know, that uh, we collaborated with folks uh, to do, uh, various programs and things like that. And so that's when I began to feel, okay, comfortable, all right, I have relationships, right, I know how to reach out to people who could help me, right, how to build a team, you know, uh, um, that could move the school forward in ways we thought would be beneficial for kids. Okay. For kids. Mm -hmm. And so, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right. So. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now, what are your, what are your plans uh, for the school? Where, you've taken it to where and where do you want to take it? Or is there any place other than where it is now that you want to take it? Well, I think we're at, I think, uh, you know, the district, we're looking at the district and the, uh, the high school, um, for the last 12 years, my, my vision for Weston has been, how do we make an excellent school more excellent? And excellence is not a static thing, mm -hmm. right? It, it's like the Constitution, you know, it's, you know, we work for that ideal and we're always striving. And so one year, excellence might mean, you know, we add more courses. Excellence might mean we focus on another special education and build up student support, which I'm very proud of mm -hmm. that we've done. We've built up that support for students, mm -hmm. um, various folks in the building and I in the district. Um, I think our, where we want to go is to think differently about how we educate students. Let me give you an example. This year, or in June, we piloted a program called June Academy. What? June Academy. Okay. Where after the seniors have left the building, we discarded the regular curriculum for those last two weeks of school and we had a series of seminar courses mm -hmm. that kids could take, mm -hmm. right? From organic chemistry to bike repair to we had a course called The Amazing Race where kids um, <laughs> had, you know, went out through the city of Boston with tasks to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Shark Tank where kids had to come up with a business proposal for the school, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, uh, and that was an idea from two of my department heads. Oh, okay. okay. And they brought it to me, and I liked it. I took it to the rest of the curriculum cabinet, and they liked it. And you know, we just sold it and says, mm -hmm. "What if?" Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I think schools of our caliber—that's really where we need to go. You can only add so many courses, right? Mm -hmm. You can only add so many AP courses, so many honors courses. You know, but how can we rethink how we teach and learn differently? And we thought, so that's. That's one idea that we're, and it was a collaboration with parents and students and, and teachers. Uh, students actually had skin in the game. You know, when kids come to school, they don't have, really have a say in what they get taught, right? But here, they had an actual say. You know, in the development of courses, we had a few students who actually team taught with a teacher, right? And we put it on your transcript. Now, how cool is that to say that, you know, I helped teach a course or I took a course and such as such a subject, right? And uh, and so we're going over the feedback for the um, the first year, you know, and take it to the kids and faculty and retool for next year. Is that a student feedback system? Uh, students and teachers will be filling out a survey first day back, mm -hmm. professional day. Um, and uh, so yes, teachers and students will be the t students have already done it for both okay. weeks. They've already done that. We have that feedback. Teachers will be doing that the first day back. What about under the normal system? Do you have a feedback system from students? Uh, students have um, mid-year surveys in each course, right? And we do it in January, early February, so some of that feedback could be put into place in the second half of the year. Instead, we used to wait till the end of the year to uh, get student feedback on the mm -hmm. courses that they're taking. So now we do it mid-year, mm -hmm. mid-year, right? So we can actually implement the feedback, you know? So that's each course, each discipline, mm -hmm. so. Have you experienced any incidents, racial incidents in your school? Personally, no. Not you, yeah, but students. yes, yeah. yes, and it was one of the most powerful moments about four years ago now. Um, that recent? Uh, yeah, it was uh, four or five years ago. I, okay. I think maybe four. All right. Four or five years ago, uh, somebody wrote, we had an art show, okay. and somebody wrote nigger on top, a scrawled nigger across one of the, yeah, the pictures. Yeah, 
yeah. in the painting. Mm. And it was a tipping point for us. And I gathered all our leaders together and I said, you know what? What are we going to do about this? Mm. And we decided students are going to respond to this. Right? And I gathered all our student leaders together. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is our school. All right. Students did that. How are we going to address it? And students handled it. They had an all-school assembly. Our seniors, some of our seniors, came back from their internships. And we had all of our student leaders address their peers and say, this cannot stand. All right, this is not who we are. Um, don't do this. All right? And kids felt the outrage from all segments of the student community. And the adults were there. And no more incidents. Since then, it was a very powerful moment, right? Where, where blacks, whites, mm -hmm. kids of every persuasion stood up and said, not in our school, mm -hmm. right? And we had an all-school assembly. Uh, we had an advisory. We didn't let everybody know uh, what happened in advisory, small groups. Mm -hmm. and then they came to the assembly, all right? We told them what had happened. We told them about some other things that had happened, not necessarily racial in nature, but, you know, violence against our community, mm -hmm. right? kids talking to their peers and then we debriefed in our advisory in small groups right and some of our seniors helped facilitate those conversations as well as the adults mm -hmm. and it was very powerful we had members of the school committee there our superintendent was there was a part of it and teachers were a part of it but the students led it mm -hmm. the students led it from beginning to end and it was a very powerful moment mm -hmm. right and it was more effective than anything the adults could have said right how diverse is your teaching staff? The teaching staff is not as diverse as any of us would want it. Um, I'll tell you, Richard, and I've said this publicly, it has been very hard to keep, to hire and retain teachers of color. Uh, Why is that? Um, because they want to go to Boston. They want to work? They want to go to Boston or an urban okay. area. <laughs> and here's what I want to say on TV, um, and what I tell teachers of color, particularly right. African-American teachers of color. Okay. We have some Asian teachers of color. We have uh, teachers, uh, Latino teachers of color, a handful, we, you know, um, okay. um, more Asian uh, American teachers than anything else. And we have, uh, we've had African-American teachers. We have a couple now. Um, but I've had teachers say, there's nothing for me here. I need to go to a city. And I think that's absolutely the wrong way to look at it, mm -hmm. you know, because they're Here's what I say, there are kids here, mm. and the majority of them may be white kids, they may not be black kids, even more reason for you to be here. Okay. Because these kids need to see, not just people who look like you and me, all right, but white students need to see principles of color, they need to be guidance counselors writing your letter of reference, they need to be teaching CP and honors chemistry and mathematics and history. Right? They need to see that, right? in all levels. We need not just be coaches, but we need to be athletic directors, I I understand. Okay? No. making decisions. Mm -hmm. People need to see us and interact with us in positions of authority that really are affecting their lives. Right? They need to have people of color. I'm the one who suspended you, but also brought you back into the community, Help, helped you get on the right path. Mm -hmm. I think that's powerful, and it goes a long way to changing attitudes. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm but I don't think a lot of people see it that way. And part of what I've learned in Newton and in Weston is that that is very powerful and it's something we need to think about because we think of teachers of color, we think of the urban areas only. And we need, we need people everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Don't ignore the suburbs. Mm -hmm. There's work to be done there just by your presence and being good at your job. Um, uh, and being good at your job and, yeah. and teaching things, teaching kids and right. having kids needing to wrestle with you, rely on you, argue with you as you stretch them, as they learn, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's the dirty work, okay? That's the hard work, mm -hmm. day in, day out. And sometimes you, you can see that you're making a difference and a lot of times you can't, mm -hmm. right? Until later. But I think that's a gift that keeps on giving. And so, um, and Jamie and uh, Jamie got together a cohort with uh, UMass Boston for a few years, other area schools to have a pipeline to get 
uh, teachers of color into suburban schools. And unfortunately, there's some turmoil there in UMass Boston, and so it really didn't get off the ground. But I thought it was very exciting, mm -hmm. you know, where we would deliberately target suburban schools and, and bring folks from a place like UMass Boston and place them in Lincoln Sudbury or Concord or Wellesley or mm -hmm. Weston. Uh, and I think that could be very powerful for all kids, for kids of color, but for our white students as well, mm. right? And so I think I would like to see educators think more along those lines because I do and think... What's your goal for accomplishing this? Well, you know, um, I think it has to be collaboration with institutions, and Weston did have a collaboration with uh, Boston College, yep. where we attempted to. What do you What do you recruit? How do you recruit? Well, I think you know, um, I think we have to go old school and go outside of the New England area sometimes. Uh, go to uh, go to historically black colleges, you know, and entice folks to come to come uh, to New England whether it's Weston or, or the, let's say the Metro West area. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the incentives is that you're, you're able to learn your craft, mm -hmm. you're able to accomplish some real serious goals, and you'll have a powerful impact on different types of children, right? And if you want to, I think in the long run, have an impact on perceptions and attitudes on race, come into some of these suburban schools, all right? and get in the middle of their lives, okay, in a school where kids spend most of their time, mm -hmm. right, most of their time. I think that, for me, is incentive enough. If you're serious about teaching and you want to influence the next generation and you actually want to influence race relations, mm -hmm. all right, here's a way to do it. What's your school population? Uh, the high school is about 715, 720. Mm -hmm. How many people do you, how many do you normally graduate? Oh, between 165 and 175, and with outliers, we had you know a couple of big classes along the way. What's the rate of college attendance? Uh, 97, 98 percent, nearly 100 percent. 90 percent? Over 90 percent, close Over to 90. 100. Yeah, 97, 96, 97 percent or more. Some kids take a gap year, you okay. know, take a gap year, but we do phenomenally well. Mm -hmm. So. It's, what, what do you, when you want to make sure that this is happening, how do you accomplish that? When I want to make sure that, that you're getting that kind of quality for kids who want, who want to go to college. Well, I think most folks who are at Weston want to go to college, um, or, or, um, and most of them do. Mm. All right, and so we're in a phase where we're beginning to look at things like, as I said, most, most folks, a lot of folks are beginning to think about gap years. You know, they travel abroad or they want to do some sort of service work or something, you know, before they go to school, mm -hmm. right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, many folks move to Weston because of the school system, as I'm sure they do in Wellesley, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we're no different uh, than that. And so, um, but I think we're doing a much better job of making sure that everyone is prepared mm -hmm. to go to college. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of programming. And I'm very proud of what Weston, the high school, and the folks that and we've done together, uh, central administration of the high school, the district in general, to supporting all students, students who struggle, social and emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, who may want a different path, you know, being able to provide supports for them. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, you know, that we've been able to do that mm -hmm. in concrete ways to help students, you know, who maybe didn't see themselves being in, uh, being able to achieve some measure of excellence, mm -hmm. that they can do that now with certain programs that... What are your networking groups? Uh, I have principals groups, uh, the DCL principal, principals, uh, in our, that's our league, so, you know, the Newtons, Brookline, Wellesley, uh, Waltham. Mm -hmm. uh, I have um, a, another principals group that is facilitated uh, through Human Resource Service with Rob Evans. Um, uh, who is a psychologist uh, that we rely on. Um, there are educators at my church, Grace Chapel, and we go to the Watertown campus, and every now and again educators will meet, you know, from various districts, you know, to talk about our work and support uh, each other. Um, 
And then there's the informal networks of people you just meet, meet along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, you meet along the way in various capacities at conferences or what have you that you just, you know, um, uh, stay in touch with. Uh, last year I had the opportunity to be a fellow from the uh, uh, Educational Research Fellow with the Rennie Center. Mm -hmm. uh, Where's that? The, uh, the Rennie Center is in Boston, okay. based in Boston, but it was a cohort of principals. Uh, and superintendents and teachers and we looked at various you know we met monthly mm -hmm. we traveled to Pennsylvania to DC for conferences mm -hmm. and so that's been a support group in terms of newsletters outreach you know you have folks who you can reach out to um, if you need to you know for support you know uh, uh, personal support or professional support you know or you want to bounce ideas off and so uh, I, I have several networks that have been helpful to me over the years, and mentors, mentors. Do you have any hopes like uh, some of the principals that I have known to uh, become a superintendent? Perhaps. <laughs> uh, right now I'm focused on 2017, 2018. Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume you uh, looked at the, that scene and you uh, assessed it. I, I, I assess many things all the time, Richard. <laughs> so, <laughs> how about how about teaching at a college? Uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, you know, I've I've been thinking about that recently, actually. Um, but uh, you know, K through twelve is you know high school is what I know. You know, and K through twelve, I'm interested in K through twelve simply. Uh, you know, the longer I'm, I'm, I've been a principal, the more I see the connections between elementary to middle to high school. Mm -hmm. And one of the things Weston is really focusing on is, you know, um, you know, vertical alignment between what we do, you know, as a district, you know, and how kids learn and the programs we do. So that's really where my heart is and where my thinking is. Mm -hmm. And the things that I read about, you know, is, is vertical alignment, you know, when kids enter a system, to when they, that holistic view, you know, uh, when they get out. And that's, that's where my intellectual passion is right now. So mm -hmm. college, I'm sure it could be a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd have to finish my PhD. Mm -hmm. you know? How far along are you? <laughs> I'm ABD <laughs> what? for the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Where are you doing that? Uh, BC. Yeah, BC. BC, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you, yeah, I know you're working on it. What's the th what's the theme? What's your major subject in, in your? Well, that's that, your, well, that's the that's the thesis is going to be like. Uh, that's the question. Uh, okay. At the time, I took a job to be principal at Weston High School and sort of never looked back. Okay. You know, and uh, and so I would have to really double down on what would the theme be? Mm -hmm. You know, with 12 years under my belt now, if I were yeah. to take it up again. I, there's a couple of topics that I could see making work, you know, yeah. because n now after 12 years I have something to say. Mm. Right? I don't know about you, these lights are killing me. <laughs> Make my eyes weep, but okay, okay. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. So. Well, now, I know that you brought your lovely wife with you. Mm -hmm. Where did you meet her and when? <laughs> I met Cynthia in... What's her name now? Cynthia. Cynthia. Yes. Okay. Uh, I met Cynthia in March 1991. And I was here to do a story for Sojourners Magazine. Okay. She was part of a... You were writing those days. Yes. Okay. And uh, the person who introduced us and later married us, a gentleman by the name of Eugene Rivers, uh, was on the board of the magazine mm. in Washington, D.C. And I came to do a story on his church and community. She was part of a community of um, black nerds, these black graduates from Harvard, MIT, and Dartmouth who were mm -hmm. doing good works in Dorchester. Okay, she a Harvard graduate? She is. She got both degrees from Harvard. Okay. And, uh, um, and so I came to do a story on this community. Okay. And met her. And as we tell the story, you know, a few days later, I called my mom and said, I think I met someone, and she called her mom. 
<laughs> and I think I met someone. And, and so that was March 91, June 1st, 91. I was living here. We were married in September uh, 92. And here we are. That's it. Family? Here we are. Yes, yes. Three sons. Um, okay. Um, and I married and became a dad at the same time. She had a two year old, mm -hmm. and Omari, who's now 28. Mm -hmm. And Marcus is a third grade teacher in Boston. Okay. And uh, at the Codman Academy Charter School, uh, which I serve on the board of. And uh, so, and my youngest, David, is 20, and he is a junior at the Fox School of Business at Temple University in Philly. Okay. Yes, does very well. So mm -hmm. we're proud of all three. Proud of all three. So how often do you have your family reunion? How many people show up when you have your reunion? Or do you have one? Uh, with just my immediate family? Yeah. Everyone shows up. Hmm? Everyone shows how, up. What's everyone? How many people don't know? Uh, well, my sons, uh, usually my, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, they're in Weymouth, um, my mom, hmm. and uh, various and sundry girlfriends. You know, Is this so, an annual affair or just periodically? No, big holidays will do. You All know, holidays. Huh? You know, Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll have special get-togethers, just cause, mm -hmm. right? We just want to be together. Yeah, okay. You know, so I'm very grateful for that, that folks still want to come home. Mm -hmm. You know, the boys, one lives with us, and the, other, and the other's in school, but, uh, and our oldest, Omari, lives in Boston, but uh, we see him frequently, so that's nice. Very that's good. Nice. I grew up as an only child, just my mother and I, mm -hmm. and so it's very nice to have the whole package. Now does, what, what does the wife do now? Well, I call her a consultant, but she works for, she needs to say this herself. For what? Um, what's your? The Interaction Institute for Social Change. Interaction Institute for Social Change. Ah. And she does uh, leadership and diversity training and collaboration and facilitation training. Mm -hmm. And so her office is based in Boston and she travels a lot working with various groups. Okay. Uh, on these various skills. She's an, she's an air flighter. She is. <laughs> she is. I know about, yes. about that. <laughs> <laughs> she is. And, so, and she's been doing it for 18 years. 18 years with uh, IISC. And okay. so, same uh, job. Same job. Same That's job. remarkable. It is. Yeah. It is. She's very she's good at it. Okay, well, evidently, <laughs> <laughs> you don't stay in a place unless you're good at what you do. <laughs> yes, he's in high demand, so. Mm -hmm. So now, when I first asked you to come on the show, what did you think I was going to do for you? I didn't know. I was you. just, I, I was going to ask you, how did you come to read my profile? LinkedIn. Okay. You, you joined me on LinkedIn. All right. I, you know, we do the thing. We don't know who we're inviting, but we invite. I don't know whether I invited you or you invited me, but uh, here we are. Here we are. Well, I was glad I, to get I, it. I opened it up one day, and there you were. Yeah, okay. And I said, oh, this looks good. Yeah. So uh, uh, LinkedIn, has, uh, I found it to be a very interesting social media. It is. I would agree with that. And the only problem is I'm not looking for a job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I don't have any jobs to give away. <laughs> so I get trapped in the middle, uh, particularly by LinkedIn, who keeps wanting to train me. Okay. <laughs> they keep offering me courses <laughs> to improve my skills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't used my skills in the work that I did mm -hmm. for about, this is, this is 2017, about, uh, oh, Ten years. Mm, what work did you do? I was a consultant, management consultant. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. I also I worked for the government for a number of years. Okay. I worked for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. Yeah. All right. Do you know about them? I do. I okay. Do. Mm -hmm. And I learned an awful lot about you know, human resources and, and personnel management. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one day I said, well, I, why, why do I have to work for the government? I can do this on my own. Mm. So I began doing my own thing uh, uh, in that area. Okay. Uh, but this is not about me. We're not, we're not <laughs> talk, talk about me. <laughs> anyway, I had it. It was a it was a marvelous marvelous occupation for me to be engaged in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I met a, a nice lady who happened to be. Uh, she became the dean of Radcliffe. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, we got married in Martina Horner's home, who was the president of Radcliffe when I, we got married. Wonderful. But again, we're talking about me. Huh? Well, that's like that. okay. That's <laughs> all right. It's a conversation. <laughs> but tell me some of the good things you've had, had, good activities that you've had with your family. Oh, goodness. Um, well, you know, Cynthia and I were in a, an interesting phase of life, you know, being in our 50s with adult children, and so we we're doing some of the things we didn't really do when mm -hmm. we were younger. So, for instance, we were in Maine uh, a couple of weeks ago and had a fabulous time together uh, uh, doing simple things. We like to eat out a lot as a family, and so about two weeks ago, all the boys, we all gathered and had a meal. Uh, in Watertown at a rest, one of our favorite restaurants, mm -hmm. and it was like old times. So nothing, nothing fancy, you know, uh, and so, and we just, we like to go for walks, you know, like to go for walks. I uh, can't do that. In, in the <laughs> evening, and uh, you know why we still can't. Uh, my, my hips won't let me do that. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, um, you know, the boys have their lives right now, and, and so we, uh, uh, as as it should be, they're at that phase where you know they're put getting their themselves together, mm. you know, and uh, and so and we're there as resources and supports for them, and so we're spending a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with each other, which is which is fun. Did your young folks go in the direction in which you wanted them to go? Or did you have to pull, yeah. do a little pulling and pushing and dragging mm. to get them where you wanted them to be, or did they just kind of strike out on their own? You know, um, for the most part, no. In high school, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that yeah. was a challenge in, for yeah. in some areas and sometimes not. Uh, but, uh, you know, Amari, uh, he's in nutrition policy, works for a small uh, food company and loves it. He went to, uh, he was in the School of Management at UMass Amherst and uh, uh, loved it and he's happy. And he has a business on the side you know, he started a DJ business when he was in college, mm -hmm. right? And uh, came out of college with, with $6,000 that, you know, he didn't go into college with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he has that entrepreneurial spirit, as does my younger son, you know, younger son. What's your younger son going to do when he graduates? Well, he's, in, he's finance and accounting major. Uh, and so his goal is to be a millionaire. And so be what? a millionaire. <laughs> and so it puts him on that path. I don't know anybody who didn't have, have the goal. <laughs> and so business, uh, he's, he's business and investing. That's, you know, that's what he wants to do. And uh, Marcus has always had a bent towards kids. And I believe he got that itch, not necessarily from what I did, but working with his mother teaching Sunday school, believe it or not. That's where I actually think he got the itch to be an elementary teacher because he would help her okay. every Sunday with the little kids, and he was very good at it. And, and so he went in to be an elementary teacher. And so going into college, he pretty much knew that teaching was what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He was going teaching, guidance counseling, you know, but uh, he's a third grade teacher, and uh, he's good with kids. Uh, and so having two Mr. Parkers in the house, you know, it's been <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. Well, you've got a good story to tell, and you've told me a good story. Well, I hope Anything so. Anything else you want to add on? Uh, uh, no. Uh, you know, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here, uh -huh. and um, I was very gratified to get your, your. You think we could get your, your wife on camera? We can't get her on a mic, but do you think we can get her on the camera? I think you absolutely could. Uh, see, she, see if she can slide around behind you there. Mm -hmm. She looks better. Yeah, okay. You know. <laughs> and, uh, there she is. This is Cynthia. <laughs> if you get close to him, you can speak in his mic and just say hello to the, to the rest of the world. <laughs> well, hello, and thanks again for the invitation. <laughs> Talk to him in the mic. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. Not, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good. All right. So you can give him more detail about what you do? I could, yes. Um, and in a way, we. I are think if you. You can stand up a little bit. Just lean towards him. Right. There you go. How's that? Yeah. 
Great. Yeah, so we, uh, I work at kind of the intersection of collaboration and social change. And part of what we do, as Anthony was saying, is teach people how yeah. to work together, how to facilitate agreements, how to plan collaboratively, mm -hmm. how to build a strong team, all of those sort of fundamentals. And then the other part of what we do is design and facilitate planning processes in organizations or in networks that are trying to improve education. Or I, sometimes I say everything from arts and culture to youth development and the whole rest in between. Environment, housing, health, economic stability in communities. Mm -hmm. So it puts me in the room with folks who are trying to be the solution to many, many problems in our society. All right, okay. Good. Well, I'm glad you showed up with him. <laughs> he, he, he said, I'm going to bring somebody with me, and I never heard from him. I did write you, but you didn't hear back from me. I did write you. I did. Yeah, you must have written me while I was in the room. Okay. No, yesterday. Yesterday afternoon. Oh, yesterday. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, we got along well without anybody else. We did. And we got a little, got a little shot in the good arm from, from your wife. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I told her, I'm glad you're coming with me. I'm glad you're coming with me. But well, I want to thank both of you for coming. Well, thank you for I, having I, us. I enjoy doing the show. I was well, well, four in fourth year with it. Uh, I, I think it's great. I, I, had, I, had a, I, had a, I had a great one on, on Thursday of a young woman who was a very popular singer. Mm. Who bought five people to attest to her how, her, how, how good she is? <laughs> Everybody needs a fan club. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to wrap here. All right. You've got some more you want to nope. share with me. And nope. uh, well, I hope this has been. Thanks, Dave. Right there, you can hang there. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for having me. I hope this was helpful to you or uh, useful to you. I hope this is what you wanted. I, you know. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. been a pleasure. I, I mean, me. it's it's it's. We're in the suburbs. I've mm -hmm. lived in I've lived in Wells for thirty seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been greatly involved in in the town, and I've I've watched and tried to work uh, in the area of diversifying mm -hmm. uh, various entities of the town, and and, and, and of course, uh, running into some difficulties here and there. Sure. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I, and this is my diversity and inclusion is what I like to deal with. Well, that's and wonderful. You, you, as far as I'm concerned, you're diverse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, you are. Uh, well, I want to thank you, my audience, for watching my show. Continue. I am Richard S. McGee, and you are watching the Learning Tree. Good night.